Uh, this one is going to be much shorter than the previous one. Um, so, why linting? Because it promotes uh, good coding practices, because code needs to be maintained. Maybe very important for some teams that you can avoid style debates doing code reviews because the linter will do this for you. So you'll not end up having to bother about the style. It prevents bugs because despite the fact that some people believe that linters are not finding bugs, sometimes they do. Linters are not only about style, they also highlight bugs sometimes. Also, it's easy migrations like uh, what happens with a newer version of Offensible, and so on. And because you do not want to be ashamed of code you write, uh, you wrote when others will see it. Uh, bit of a background regarding Ansible Link. So it was authored by uh, Will Thames in 2013, and it was officially adopted by Ansible team in 2019. It is an official tool for rating Galaxy roles, but is not used only for Galaxy roles. It can be used on any Ansible playbook or role. And it is a 100% community project, which means that there is nobody in Ansible team that works on Ansible in directly. It's a community effort, which means we need more help uh, from users in, their, in order to make it better. So, um, over the time, uh, people complained that linking is a waste of time. Luckily, not everyone. Uh, and it does require time if you try to add linting to something that never had linting and you try to do it perfectly for, uh, from start. It's like trying to fix all the reported errors. This would be a big mistake, and this is why pe some people had bad experiences with, uh, with linter, because it's like too much thing to fix. Why should I do this? Another reason for this is that they did not read why a specific linter rule was introduced. What are the reasons behind it? Because maybe they, they didn't encounter this problem. So, the key um, aspect here is do it gradually. How you do a gradual uh, adoption of Ansible Lint? First, you activate the linter, but you disable all the rules because you do not want to prevent other changes in your repository from merging and because probably there are a lot of them to fix. After this, in follow-ups, you start fixing them one by one, but addressing them, this is first option, adding local white, uh, white listing, or doing a global ignore if you, let's say, if your team does not agree with, with this rule at all, or there are like bugs or other, other reasons. Also, remember to bump the linter version every now and then. I recommend it a month, but it depends on the project. Some project may want it to do it once a month, some may want to do it every quarter or something like this. Some of them are doing yearly. Um, installing Ansible Lint is quite easy. Uh, I do recommend you to use version conditioning in order not to be surprised if a new version of the, the linter starting to report your code and breaks your workflow. The output is very easy to read. And uh, as you can see uh, in the output, he is using the same format as Playgate. Uh, and the rule is very simple. Error code zero, if it passes. Error code one, if it didn't pass. Uh, so what to do when you have a false positive? Instead of disabling the rule completely, you can 
put a local tip. And yeah. the syntax is identical with the one that use, is used by Flegate, which is the main linter on, on Python, with no QA from no quality assurance. So, um, in this case, uh, probably this is not only for people that use Ansible Lint, that state latest, it is a wording because you are supposed to to put, to put a specific version. But in some cases, you may want to update to the latest version, regardless which one it is. And in this case, adding a simple comment, you resolve the problem. And the linter will not bother you. So this is the local thing of, uh, of an issue. Now, you may end up wanting to disable some rules globally. And this, in this case, you have the, the Ansible config file where you can put a skip list. There is something that I would recommend anyone to do is when they create a skip list here, always document what is the full rule name because the numbers do not say a lot and people should not Google in order to find out what is rule 701, right? And also put the reason why, because there are two valid reasons why someone may skip a rule. One is like, you just introduced the linter or upgraded the linter, so this is a new rule. You didn't have time to fix it, which is a, is good to disable it if you mention this. The other reason is maybe you found a bug. Maybe the linter is broken and it's giving a five fold receive and you want to disable it, but always put a link that, that sends the user to the bug because Two months from now, six months from now, when someone else will open the same file to look at it, they should know if they should remove this or because it was temporary and probably the linter has a new version so they can remove the line or this is there to, to stay because the team decided to, uh, that they do not want to respect this specific rule. Um, there are some cases where you may want to disable linting on specific files or directories. And this is important with Ansible Lint, especially because Ansible Lint, all Ansible code is YAML file, right? Uh, but you for sure you have other YAML files which are not Ansible. And there is no header on, on these YAML files telling if this is managed by, uh, it is an Ansible file or if this is something else from another tool. And sometimes this may confuse the tool. And in this case, you may want to put some ignores on it. There are other uh, corner cases, like if you use some encrypted data that may confuse the parser. And in some even less often used cases, you may not be able to install a module that is used in production. And the linter will discover that this module doesn't exist. I cannot, I cannot fully link this file, the verify parameters and so on. And in these cases, you, it is okay to put, um, to, to exclude some, some files. Um, this is how it looks when, uh, you, when, you, when you put excludes. Always mention why. It's the same as the slide before. When you put exclude skips, mention the reason and link to a bug. So next person visiting the code, they will not have to use git blame to figure out why this was added there. Um, okay, there is another way because Ansible Lint is not the only linter you'll ever want to use. And probably you already use other linters and uh, it becomes hard to cope with all these linters, right? How do you run, you, you create jobs for each of them. What if you have 10 linters? We have projects with more than 10. Uh, the idea is to use a single job that is doing all the linters. And there is a tool for this, which is called pre-commit. Do not confuse it with git pre-commit hook, which is aim exactly exists, running all the linters, orchestrating linters. Uh, for people that are used to use talks for testing Python code, this is, is doing for 
running linters, the same thing that TOS is doing for testing Python. Orchestrating different environments, and it's very easy to use. Also, it's much faster because it has some feature like avoiding to create clones for each repository if you have the same uh, same linter in different repositories. Um, so it, it is very fast and scales very well, and is it is easy to to update it. Uh, and I'll give you uh, an example here. This is the configuration for adding Ansible Lint. And as far as I know, most of the linters around the world do already support pre-commit, play case, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, you have one command to run it. The, uh, that's all. Uh, the best part about it is that if you want to update it now, for example, if a, a new version of the linter um, appeared, you just run pre-commit auto-update. And it will look at all the hooks or linters that are listed here and see if the new a new tag is, is published and it will bump it for you. So you are not supposed to go to see if a new version of the linter uh, was published because it's doing this for you. In this case, it, it, it doesn't look at a big, uh, big deal, but imagine that you have 10 of them. And if you have 10, the, 10 of them, you do not want to do the bo uh, boring part about visiting each of them to see if a new version is available if, uh, and if you want to, to bump it or not. Uh, that's all the introduction to Ansible Lint. Uh, now, questions, please. Let me see on IRC. Um, Um, no questions? I see some comments here, but nothing that is a specific yes, question. Uh, uh, questions in IRC, so there's a, a question, what is the best practice to lend to whole directory structure? Um, is it just to do a recursive find for YAML files and then renounceable lint okay. against uh, yes, maybe I missed to mention this, but version uh, 4.2, which is relatively new, it's less than a year, I think it, it was in October, November, something like this release, had the ability to discover files by default. In the past, you were supposed to do this, uh, the stuff that we, we seen on, uh, on IRC, like doing a find for all YAML files and giving them to YAML list. This is the old approach. Now you can run uh, Ansible Lint without any parameters and it will it will look for all the YAML files. If it fails to, to parse any YAML file, it will display it, but it will not fail the tool. Ansible Lint will give you an error only if it finds error inside the file, not if it fails to parse the YAML file, mainly because some of these YAML files uh, may not be Ansible one. So if it fails to identify it as an Ansible um, playbook role task file or um, uh, variable file, it will not give the error. So now it is able to figure out um, what is Ansible or not. It's not a perfect process. There are still, I think, one at least one one bug. Um, open re regarding it, but it's much easier than using find, which was also not very portable. Um, so I hope I, I answered the question regarding how. Is the just run it because it will find all the YAML files. Uh, and if it doesn't, work file a bug and we'll try to fix it. But it's much easier. Maybe it's, it's uh, matching the same behavior as other, other linters that are like Markdown linter, uh, Prest linters, Python linters, and so on. It's like, look what you have inside your repository. Um, yes, yeah, this is a, a known issue, the vault. 
And this is why I mentioned at this moment, uh, the only option is to exclude these files, the ones that um, uh, that have encryptions. Because Ansible link is using two different YAML parsers in order to, to load the files. And they have different requirements and behaviors because also looking for um, for comments. It's quite complex of what it does inside in order to, to figure out the nature of the, the YAML file. And um, for the moment, the only option uh, possible is to whitelist keep the files that um, are not possible. Thank you. And then there's a question. Do you have any, have you used Ansible Review at all? So Ansible Review, do you have any yes, views on that? I use the Ansible Review. So um, keep this in mind. Uh, the tool is made by the same author and Ansible Review is using Ansible Link. It's, so it's not, it's not like a different tool, it's something on top of it. But Ansible Review was aimed to perform reviews on Delta changes, on diffs. So um, it has a very different use case, and it cannot do the same stuff that is doing a full linting of an entire repository, because it's looking at diffs. So it can perform uh, a linting on on a diff, but uh, this doesn't also work well with all kind of tests. There are some tests where you need to look inside the um, the entire code base. Think about stuff like you have includes, right? And you you need to be able to load the included file to see if this works and so on. So uh, basically, Ansible Link it's 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 a different it's a different use case. I would say. Um, Excellent. Thank you. Any more yeah. questions from anyone? Oh, sorry, sorry. And did you have something further to say? I don't mean to cut you off. Yes, um, someone mentioned on uh, on IRC that there were some talks regarding merging back the two tools, but uh, nothing concrete has uh, happened at this moment. But uh, as long as you you do remember that Ansible Review is using uh, Ansible Link, it should. Uh, it should be clear, right, for, for you. And uh, by the way, uh, you can write your own rules. And uh, I know in OpenStack that we have few repositories where we have some custom rules written in Python, which are loaded by the um, by the linker. So you are not forced to use only the rules that are merged into the linker. And uh, you can write your own that are added to the default set of rules. And what happened in the past was that I think I moved from custom rules that we had on OpenStack, I contributed them back to the linter, to Ansible Lint, so they became more, more generic ones. So, it, but it's, um, it's a nice feature that you have that you can write your own, because maybe you have some special conditions that do, let's say, people in uh, managing Ansible Lint would not enjoy these rules, right? So much. Uh, also, in the future, I think we will want to implement some groups of rules. So you can have like uh, a set of rules, especially for Galaxy, that is enabling and disabling some of them, uh, and others more strict and so on. At this moment, you can just enable or disable each rule, but not by groups. Because we had some rules in the past where that were quite controversial, I would say. They were proved to be very useful for some people, but some people were very strong against them. And what you can do in this case is like, okay, you split them, you you implement all of them, but not enabled at once, right? So it's much easier for people to, to switch between one mode to another, right? Some of, so, some of the users may be more purist than others, right? Um, I think that's all from me.
That's great. Uh, thank you again for your time on Ansible Lint and also on, on Molecule. Looks like there's lots of interesting questions. Uh, um, if you've not used it before, have a dig, uh, dig through those docs. So now we're going to um, shift back to collections. So for the next bit, what I thought we'd do is we'd sort of start off with the end user experience for collections of what we're trying to achieve, uh, how different people operate with operate. Uh, use it, the user experience, and then with those requirements in mind, we can then sort of um, dig into the details of how it's actually implemented and oh well, how, how the implementation so far, where we're up to, and then the next steps. So I'm going to hand over uh, to Matt Davis to talk a little bit about Ansible Base, so he'll explain what it is, where it's come from, and that that's sort of the foundation, uh, just from the user experience. If Matt is there and ready to jump in. Yep. Thank you. Uh, am, I, am I loud enough, or do I need to like crank my mic volume a little bit? That's nice and clear, thanks. OK. Um, yeah, so just to talk a little bit about yeah what what Ansible Base is um, when we first kind of started this whole uh, journey of of um, taking taking a lot of content out of the Ansible Ansible distribution, uh, we were trying to figure out like what how small of a thing can we make here, and even even up until just a few months ago, that that was kind of an ongoing question uh, about like how how small can we go. And what we ended up with was uh, the, the the original intent was was we were kind of hoping that we would be able to just say okay the the core execution engine there are no modules there are no module utils or the, and and everything would be collections based that was there that was kind of the direction that we were being pushed uh, by you know certain forces inside Red Hat as well as just uh, from a, from a kind of cleanliness standpoint, like, oh, well, that should be the way we, we can do it. But uh, realistically, we ran into all sorts of things where, like, there were um, things even inside of Ansible itself that, that relied on uh, module utils and stuff and, uh, that, that we shipped in the box. So what we, what we kind of backed off to was this thing called that ended up being called Ansible Base. So uh, that Ansible base will be uh, a new PyPI package. So uh, when you when you do pip install Ansible uh, from 2.10 onward, you're still going to that's going to be the batteries included Ansible that you've always been used to. Uh, that that's that's going to have a bunch of collections baked into it. Uh, so that that'll be the thing that we're calling Ansible community dist distribution. Uh, Ansible base is a new PyPI package that. Uh, Ansible community distribution will depend on that actually contains the core execution engine and the the kind of what we're calling now still the core modules, which basically are very minimal set of things that are there to support like what do you need to do um, what do you need to do for like um, installing packages, installing collections, uh, a few other things. But Ansible base the intent is that Ansible base itself is not going to be like all that useful to people without having a bunch of collections bolted onto it. So the Ansible community distribution is one way of getting that, uh, but we also wanted to be able to have kind of a small package that has, um, that, that you could start from. Like if you, if for, for places that have maybe more security restrictions or uh, they have an internal review board or something that says like what modules and what things are we, what content are we going to allow our users to use for security reasons, for licensing reasons, for whatever those things might be, we wanted to have a, a smaller package for them to start with. Um, I won't go into too much about why, why we ended up not doing the completely, uh, you know, just the engine with no modules, no module utils, no, you know, but it, it just basically we, we weren't ready to like rip those things we weren't ready, ready to be able to rip that stuff apart um, at the at the level that would be needed to make it totally, um, you know, just just an execution engine. So uh, we we wanted to kind of 
opt on the we, we wanted to move more toward the like kind of not letting the uh the, the good be the enemy of perfect or for, for perfect be the enemy of good whatever you like um so yeah the intent is that ansible base is there as uh just it's it's kind of a foundational component and uh if if you as a user don't really care about that and you just want to keep doing your your batteries included thing like go for it pip install ansible or however you like you know we it's still kind of tbd how um the other downstream packagers like os packagers and things are going to do this but uh we're, we're kind of expecting that most of the community packaging will remain the same so that people you know if you're used to doing debian os package or uh you know ubuntu or whatever it is that you know, when you install the Ansible package, you're probably going to get some form of ACD or something very similar to it. Um, and that Ansible base will be kind of a new package somewhere else for people who really want to start with that just very small kernel of, of stuff. I think that's that's kind of all I wanted to say about that. Um, I can just hand it back to Gundalo to talk about more of the specifics from the user experience of 2.10 going forward. Thanks, Matt. Um, again, if there's any questions, please do throw stuff in in IRC. Um, I've also put the link in IRC for what I'm showing at the moment, which is just sort of the the user cases that we're aiming for Ansible Base to to solve. And this is pretty minimal. Like, can you remember off the top of your head roughly how many modules and plugins are in there? It's like 100, 150 or something. I didn't even think it was that many, but uh, I don't know. I, I could go count real quick. So keep talking and I'll come back. <laughs> um, yeah, so Ansible Ansible was previously, well, it's, it's as of today installable as Python Ansible, as pip install Ansible, or RPM map get install Ansible. From when Ansible 2.10 is released, that will change and it'll be what we're calling ACD or the Ansible community distribution is the thing you will it will take control of the Ansible package name. Let me just walk through a bit about what that means. That means later this year, um, when you do pip install Ansible or upget install Ansible, you will actually download the new Ansible package, which will not, which just contains the collections um that we're distributing so not necessarily everything in galaxy just the ones at least initially that contained modules and plugins that used to be in ansible and then that will depend on ansible base so from an end user point of view if they're paying attention when they type their install command um they may notice that there's some extra packages and there's an extra package installed and uh, on disk, the location of where these things are written is slightly different. Well, that's it. One of the aims with this, and the reason that we're calling the next release of Ansible 2.10 rather than 3.0, and we spent a lot of time discussing this internally and externally, um, was that uh, any playbooks and roles that work in Ansible 2.9 should, and if they don't, that's a bug, should work in 2.10 without modification. Uh, we'll talk about a bit more about this in the development section later on. But basically, we're putting in a mapping file that Matt Davis is working on at the moment that puts a link from any module that, or plugin that was in 2.9 to tell you which um, collection that is now found in. And those collections will be included in this ACD. Uh, package that I mentioned earlier. So from an end user point of view, all should be good. Um, so I'm just trying to find if there's docs on this, but. 69 modules in Devel right now. If, so if I do Ansible doc dash L pipe WC or, uh, dash, uh, uh, dash L, that's 69 lines. Excellent. Yeah. Might actually be a few, uh, fewer than that, so. And it's pretty small. Thank you. Um, yeah, so from an end user point of view, everything should be good. The points where it starts to get a little different is any module or plugin that has be, been added since we did the migration. Um, so again, picking on, say, Grafana or Kubernetes, so those collections are up and running. Um, there's new modules added in there. Anyone using those new modules 
we'll need to put the full, the fully qualified collection name. So this FQCDN we talked a bit about before. So that means if someone's using a Grafana playbook, they do. Um, Ray, Ray, can you remember the name of a new module that's gone in since we created, the, since we did the repo split? Uh, you have the Grafana folder at least. Excellent, thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, cheers. So Grafana dashboard was in Ansible 2.9. So if you've got a playbook that says you can do name, set up my dashboard, Grafana underscore dashboard, and then the parameters. But if you want to use the Grafana folder module, you'll need to do community.grafana.grafana folder colon and then the appropriate um, module options to do that. So that's a, a, there's different ways of viewing that, right? You could view that as being a slightly ugly, but it's actually a, and it, it's a little bit ugly. Um, you could always put the collections keyword into uh, to say that uh, you should always look in the Grafana collection, and then you can use the short form. So just Grafana folder. But this is a nice gentle introduction to end users that there are these things called collections, and that you can and should generally. Um, Start using the fully qualified collection name, so this community.gravana format. Um, so we get most people aware that collections are a thing, and this is how we use them, and that there's different places things get from. Into the future, this will also mean we could do things like have a module called folder. So rather than it being called Grafana underscore folder, it could just be called folder, and it could be a VMware folder. At the moment, in you know in in Ansible 2.9 and earlier, we couldn't have do that. Because as uh, someone said um, earlier on today, we only have a single global namespace, so you wouldn't know what to look at. But we could have something called ansible.vmware.folder, and likewise, uh, Grafana could be community.grafana.folder. Um, so that's one of the real advantages about this, is that you can have shorter, um, clearer module names. With these different things. Uh, I want to pause at this point and ask if we have any questions or concerns about the end user um, experience or how people would in, uh, operate with this stuff. Oh, the other thing I forgot to say, sorry, is that um, even if you're using this new replacement full fat or kitchen sink package, so PIP install Ansible, that be install Ansible, you can still Git install, sorry, um, Ansible Galaxy, uh, install newer collections, uh, which will take probably take precedence over the package installed ones. So if you're waiting for a new version of ACD, um, then you can still get access to those. So I'll pause for questions because I know I went through a lot of stuff there and some of this might be new. Well, this is a point I'm really interested to, to hear if anyone's got concerns about the end user experience. Come on, JP, keep us honest. You're still there. It's absolutely. Excellent. JP is happy all problems are solved. Uh, GP at the moment is not happy. He's trying to understand what this is all about. And I think this is going to be hugely complex. Uh, but that's likely just me getting on an age. Um, uh, no, not at all. I think I, uh, to be honest, I, I really do not understand where all this is. It is to me highly confusing. You're talking about things like ACD and Ansible Base. Um, I, I don't know where this is going. I need to, um, that's why I'm here basically to try and, okay. and try and better understand what this is all about. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is one of the problems with me being a bit too close to this stuff that maybe I'm skipping over over some stuff. So let me screen share again. So we've written down this um, link back in chat. But uh, please do ignore me. I mean, I'm just one of uh, several dozen people here. Don't uh, don't slow down for me. Uh, it's uh, 
No, well, I, I pick on you because I know you will tell me. Um, <laughs> so what I would really like to know is who else is confused by this? Who else is missing just some? Just look at that page that you're showing us with terminology. That's just gigantic. Cool. Uh, someone else has uh, said they're confused. Right. Okay. So, um, just yeah. here. Yeah. Um, as I said before, we have one uh, collection. That collection was never, uh, let's say, no modules from that Sensugo collection was never part of the Ansible or Core Ansible. And our customers seem to have little to no problem comprehending what the collection is because they do not know what was available available before so maybe people who are used to ansible might have a bit more of a transitioning problem than than the others that are just coming to ansible just one observation i made during the um, when i need to support customers when i say you need to install a collection they don't don't ask why because this is something Ansible does for them because they're only starting using Ansible. Um, so yeah, the so confusion or that uh, transition period might be a bit harder for people that know the old Ansible, the old kitchen sink Ansible. Yeah, that, in that's really in, a, in, a, in addition to that which I fully agree, of course. In addition to that, I experience very many people who use Ansible in an environment which doesn't even have an internet connection. Uh, so they uh, attempt to install Ansible via, I'll call it floppy disk, I'm exaggerating, obviously, but they literally download a uh, laptop, the required modules, carry them across the firewalls and then install it in an infrastructure. How on earth are these people going to use collections? Just a rhetorical question, but it isn't really. It's not a rhetorical question. It has an answer. The collection is basically a tarball of files. If you can copy Ansible there, you can copy collection there. I was just giving instructions to one of our customers how to test collection from Git. And basically, it's just copy down and place it at the right spot so the Ansible can find it. It's really not that hard to get collection installed in a non-networked environment. Okay, if you can you get understand. your playbooks there, then you can get your collection there. You can even pack and it in the same repository, basically. Understood, uh, but that means that each individual collection has to come across separately. Today, people download, uh, so far until 2.9, people download, uh, I'll say a single tarball and they have uh, what we've been fondly calling batteries included. Uh, that is now can different. I, can I add something here? Because I've got the same problem. Documentation does not mention how to install a tar file or how to start from a Git repository the collections. This, this is a problem with the documentation because it may be possible, but it worries the people that they see that they have to rely on Galaxy server in order to get the collections, which is not true. But if you look at the documentation page, this is the impression that you get. So but you I don't know if it's a documentation out. issue, but I think it's quite straightforward. So basically, you, yeah, if you want to use Git, just clone it in the same path that you get all your collections, and that's it. What I'm trying to yeah, so, so, so this, these are really good questions. So let me just um, okay. uh, step back a little bit. Go ahead, um, uh, collect, collections are basically just, sorry, let me rephrase that. For, for a lot of people that are happy, that were happy using Ansible with supported and unsupported content, so the 2.9 package, I'm going to assume that they'll still be happy carrying on that way. So if we're talking about an offline install, that rather than one package to, to cache and put on your local um, servers, the Ansible package will now be two. So you'll need to get the Ansible and the Ansible base um, Python package or Debian packages, copy them into your local repository, and then 
that's it. So for for people that don't want to necessarily, so, so that's the lowest bar to entry, right? That's basically mirroring how things were today. It's just going from one package to two. If, however, sorry, and um, and this new Ansible package will contain every collection which, can, which contains one or more files that were previously in Ansible. So what that means is anything that was available in 2.9 will still be in one of these package, uh, one of these collections that will package in, uh, in the Ansible, in the new Ansible package in ACD. So that shouldn't break anyone. It just means there's an extra package to the cache. So JP does that and address your concerns specifically about going from 2.9 to 2.10 in a offline environment. Uh, I, uh, uh, yes, it's not, uh, don't get me wrong, I think uh, everybody who runs Ansible should be able to copy a file from point A to point B. That's not, that's not the point, I think, or that's not my point. I think um, not so much, a, a, let's say, a technical issue. It's not so much a, a thing of copying something from point A to point B. It's more... Um, that this whole change has to be conveyed somehow. And I, for myself, don't yet know exactly how this is going to happen. Sure. Yeah, and you know, th this stuff's still new. So we don't have the docs in place. This is Ansible base only came into proper existence. And by that, I mean that the, the Veldan branch changed Ansible base on Monday, so six days ago. Um, we have a lot of stuff to update in the documentations. Part of the reason that we are doing this contribute to Summit now, and that's why we, we picked this date, was that we knew we'd be far enough along with the collections work so we could have something to talk about, but also early enough in it so we can get people to sort of pretty much rip it apart and to give us this feedback. So if we need to course correct or change how we're doing things and get better docs, then we can get that feedback. Um, and, and just a, a quick point there, I think our, our planned release date for 2.10 and, and Ansible, you know, which would be the first release that has the actual release of the stuff that has Ansible base and the split collections and everything is uh, end of July right now. And that's still subject to change if there are, you know, if, if there's just a lot of, you know, this is what when, when when we start, you know, when we start having like an alpha of this stuff, like this is the time to go, like, please test your playbooks, like check, check and make sure, you know, check our work. Basically, like, did we did we totally blow something and let us know if we did? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then if you don't want to go down the full ACD route, you can just copy these collections and put them in your um, uh, version control directory where you're storing all your roles and playbooks anyway, which I know is how a lot of people use roles from Galaxy today. For example, in my uh, roles, you know, alongside my roles, I've got copies of the Girling Guy roles for setting up certain services, and I I pulled them in, they're in my change management system. So that way of doing things uh, still applies. Um, I might pause to see if there's anyone else on the, the call or the community team wants to sort of try and flesh out or help explain uh, any of those bits around the offline install or the concerns around usability. I, I'd like to say, uh something briefly this Greg um, I think part of the confusion is that we have in our planning we have talked about ACD as though it's a separate thing and we've needed to as we conceptualize the change that is going on right but uh, as we get closer to this it's becoming clear that ACD is really just going to be called Ansible, right? When when you talk about pip install Ansible, ACD, the thing that we've been talking about is what you're going to get. And our goal for 2.10 is to make pip install Ansible as seamlessly close to installing of Ansible 2.9 as possible, right? 
Under, this, under the covers, you're going to see a new dependency added for Ansible Core, and then a rebundling in some form of all of the collections that we split out of classic Ansible. But the goal is for the, the user experience to be the same. And we, you know, I, I think we're, I'm not sure how we're going to talk about ACD in the future or whether we're even going to talk about ACD. It's sort of a, a, a tricky thing where it's describing a new thing right, which is the repackaging of the way that Ansible is delivered to the vast majority of users. But from a use case perspective, it's it's targeted to the same use case as classic Ansible was. So I don't know that that is clear in all of the sort of documentation that we're doing uh, and the discussions that we're having, but I, I hope that becomes more clear over time as we start actually having a thing that people download and try mm -hmm. out. Yeah, thanks, Greg. I, yeah, I'm probably confused about talking. ACD is probably just a, a script or some build process. It's it's most likely not anything more than that. But as we're yep. talking about painting a thing, we need a name to talk about that thing. The closer you are to seeing the sausage being made, the more confused you probably are because we've been grappling with these questions for months. And because you all are very close to us, you've been seeing a lot of our confusion as we've been working through it. I feel like we're very close to the tail end of that confusion and we sort of understand what we're doing, what the pieces are. Uh, so, so I hope that to the broader community, they will have seen less of the confusing sausage making and we'll see more of the, oh, here's where we've arrived and we've done so thoughtfully and we've ended up in a, in a good place. That's, what, that's where I hope we're getting to. And, uh, and you uh, here will be the first to tell us, we very much hope, where we're missing the mark. I have to, sorry, fighting my computer. I have this very horrible little graphic which I'll try and uh, zoom in a bit. Um, confusing. Gundalo, I think this graphic might be useful just for general people to see, except with the caveat that you put, you know, pip install Ansible equals the same thing in both of these cases, right? Because that that's not clear here. And this yeah, is one uh, of the problems we're dealing with is that there are two sort of uh, viewpoints here. There's the developer viewpoint and the user viewpoint. The developer viewpoint is changing significantly, and so developers are feeling more more pain as we work through it. But the user viewpoint should be almost identical to to classic Ansible. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to say when I talk to the people that are not developing Ansible content, and they ask me what is changing, and just say. Ansible is staying the same, but what you are getting is something that is a bit slimmer, has a few modules less, a few, a few thousand less, and you can customize it fully to have only what you need. This is how I talk about Ansible base when I talk to people that are not familiar with Ansible or, or have not developed uh, Ansible content. Yeah, that's uh, nicely put. Sorry, I'm quickly updating this uh, slide on the fly. Um, try and make some of it uh, a bit clearer. Um, so the top section shows what we have like as of last year. No, so we've got um, can't do things one. So we have the core repository, you know, Ansible, Ansible, and it has these uh, three and a half thousand modules in. 
and plugins, and then that's package. So this great thing is a repository, and that's package. So the uh, repo, and then that's packaged as the Ansible Python packages or Debian packages and whatnot. And then updating this on the fly. Gandalo, did you get rid of your headset? Sorry, I loaded up my um, blue jeans on my other screen so I could see it. Um, uh, so I could see if actually what I was presenting was readable. Is that better? Yes, much. Cool. And let me just update this. So this is on school base. Right, and then this is what we're moving towards. So this section on the on the left, so this is the Ansible Ansible repository. You know, it used to have lots of uh, different modules in. They've now moved to these uh, separate things. So modules AWS and module utils AWS has moved into the AWS uh, repositories, uh, sorry, collections, which are also repositories like Wise Grafana, and everything that doesn't have a specific home has been put in community general. So that's where the code has moved in, in Git and GitHub. And then if we think about this from the packages side, so the left hand side, um, so the Ansible Ansible repository is now packaged as Ansible base. Um, most people will probably not use that, at least not initially. And then you'll notice here we have a lot of collections of which uh, some of them are put in this uh, inner box, um, which is included in ACD. So in this case, we've got AWS, Grafana, General, and some of the community one. Uh, those repositories uh, will be built together through this ACD build process we've talked about. So they'll be in the Ansible. Dash uh, 2.10, I guess I should say. Um, uh, package, which will also depend on the Ansible base package. Um, there are other repositories and collections, such as these ones down here. Um, which are not, which are collections, but are not in ACD. Therefore, they will not be available in the ACD or in the new Ansible package. Um, someone was talking earlier about a brand new collection, so this is examples of those. So Cassandra or maybe some of the security collections, uh, brand new ones. They won't at least initially be in the ACD package. I know this diagram is a bit rough and has crazy colours in, but does this help a little bit? Any questions from this side? Yes, does this mean that I'll be able to do a pip install article 210 and also get the community general modules? That is correct, yes. And Not yet, correct? No, not, like, not today, but, oh, by okay. time, right. but by the time but by the time 2.10 is released, yes. Because now what I had to do was to do Galaxy install the community general in order to bring these modules in. But later, when we'll have the release, I'll not need to do it. And I'm glad about it because it means that I can still install Ansible with the modules that I care about without calling Ansible Galaxy, just pip. And for CI, it's much easier. Really glad to, to hear this. <laughs> yeah, and this is something that some of us were pushing for, but we needed to work through the technical and non-technical parts first. Um, 
As we go into more of the technical stuff, Toe Show, um, A Badger, 1999, we'll talk a bit more about about that side. But I wanted to sort of, before we go into the technical sort of frame stuff from the end user point, because that's what it's about, right? Um, what is clear to me is that the documentation, that the picture is needed, right? And I will try and tidy this up and actually find someone that knows how to lay out technical concepts in graphics forms. Um, to help with this stuff. Um, anyone else? Does this for the people before that were had concerns or questions? Have they now been answered, or there's still further concerns there? Speaking for myself, I think I've seen some answers. Um, we do need a picture. At least I need a picture. So what you've been working on here is good. It would be great if that could be expanded on a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it was James Tanner, Jay Tanner on IRC also said, um, maybe having some, not quite FAQs, but like, I, I want to do X, how do I do that? Old, old way, new way uh, sort of documentation uh, may help people. So for these specific cases we were talked about, I do not care about collections. I just want to do my job and do it like I used to be able to do before. How do I do that? And the answer is, well, install Ansible before in 2009, install Ansible now. You're good. Caveat, new modules, use FQCN, or then going into the, the firewall, the offline install boot, talking about the different options there. Um, it would be helpful to me if people had things that they would like to see in the documentation like that, if you could just throw it in IRC, because IRC is now, is, well, we're in the community channel is logged, so we can try and uh, get some of those, yeah, before uh, before and after, as JP said, um, get some of those documented, and then we can add them into the to-do list. And, you know, if we're feeling adventurous, maybe we can start sort of hacking on some of these, um, at least in bulletproof form, in the uh, Docs Hackathon that we'll be doing on, uh, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, yeah, and uh, we'll bake these docs down from a end user point and then also a, a developer point. I think this also isn't just a question of documentation in the product. I think this is also, and this is, you know, maybe Robin can talk to this at some point, but um, we're also talking about essentially uh, sort of productization and marketing of what this thing is, right? Um, one of the things that we've seen as we've gotten more enterprise focused at Red Hat is that a lot of our marketing marketing materials have focused on uh, the Red Hat Ansible automation platform, which is the enterprise supported thing. Um, and Ansible itself has uh, gotten less focus. We talk less about what Ansible is, how you can get started quickly, uh, and you know, and that's that's one of the disconnects that we hope to uh, solve in this process, right? We've got now we've got a very clear uh, tool in Ansible that is intended to just get people started with automation. Uh, and my hope is that we can put some simplified messaging around that and have different messaging for different targets. It, the, the, the enterprise enterprise platform is for people who are already getting into to automation and have gotten to the point where they have the complex problems that we can now solve with, with you know, all of these changes. But we also want to explicitly target people who are still just getting started with Ansible, people who just need the basic stuff. Uh, and, and now we have an opportunity to do that because they're, they're much more separate things. And, you know, we, we started off the day by saying, what do we want to get out of this? And, and this is like key feedback for me. So I, I really appreciate 
people saying they're confused and they don't understand because that gives me something concrete to work on because I, I I can't tell how well we're doing at documenting this stuff until I I get people telling me. Well, and my point there also is that it's not just on on you, Gundalo. This is also the rest of our team and our community to start identifying how we can put together more community friendly packaging, messaging, how we talk about it, right? Not just what's in the documentation. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm I'm using the right we are behind for community and 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 core. And one of the other things that we're we want to do is like once we get a bit further with this of having not quite a standard slide deck, but you know, there's a few different people here that help us run the different meetups that are dotted around the world. And although they're on pause at the moment in a lot of places, having some sort of common slides and terminology um to help spread out the message there is another way of sort of educating more people, but also getting feedback, and that's something that's on our on our to do list. Yes, Mr. Tani, your job is done now. Thank you very much. Uh, cool. But I think that's all I had on the user point of view on this stuff. Um, but I'm probably missing some stuff, so I might just pick on Toshio or Tana or uh, Greg or anyone else to say what else have, I, have we not talked about on the specifically on the end, end user point of view of this. Uh, documentation is one, but I'm probably going to leave that a, a little bit later when we start to talk. I think that needs to come after the ACD build bits. Is there anything else on the end user side that we need to talk about? I have a question, uh, John, around the, the current state of the management of collection, which requires to have a Galaxy server around. Uh, some of the mission I have to work on in, includes uh, implies that I work on collections that don't have to be public in, in some ways. So I don't have a Galaxy server uh, some available to publish the collection. Yeah, it has to stay uh, on-premise uh, and, and not published on a public repository. And right now, if I'm not wrong, I, I didn't check uh, before going to, to this event. But we, are, we have no choice but to, to, to build the, 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 the tarball and uh, install the tarball. But we don't have any... Uh, built-in management of uh, the collection outside of the Galaxy server. We cannot do like we used to do with uh, roles, like uh, Antibal Galaxy install and uh, provide a Git repository uh, to install the role. And I think it's something that is missing for, for collections, right? So if I provide, if I have a collection on a Git repository and I want to install the the collection using the Galaxy command, I cannot use a Git URL, and uh, it's kind of missing in the in the, the map. Yeah, so I can understand we're talking about in the the Galaxy.yaml or in a requirements file, rather than putting the the name of something that exists in Galaxy about being able to put in a uh, a file call on slash slash or a galaxy sorry of a, a git path yeah so maybe someone from the core key team can talk about this i think there's been some discussion about this but i think it may be not on the to-do list at the moment yeah, I, I can talk about this a little bit, I guess. I, it's it's uh, only very it's tangential to where I am, but um, I, I don't know that anyone else that that can answer this better is here. So uh, unless someone interrupt me if if that's not the case, but uh, so I don't want to throw anyone under the bus here. So I will just say that um, the 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 packaging of collections on Galaxy as a tarball binary artifact versus a pointer to a Git repo was a decision that was made without consultation from 
a lot of people and it was basically already done by the time anyone else had a chance to object so <laughs> um it that it, it i i personally believe that that's kind of unfortunate in a lot of for a lot of reasons and i don't know that the galaxy side of it is going to change but I think it's important, I, I agree that it's important that the CLI be able to do this for development purposes, if nothing else, as well, and as well as like, you know, internal use cases where you don't want to host a Galaxy or Automation Hub server, but you want to point it at something. So this is something that we are definitely talking about, uh, figuring out how to, you know, if and how we can do this sanely uh, in the Galaxy CLI, but uh, I don't have any specific timing to share or if, you know that it is a hundred percent going to happen, but uh, we hear it a lot, and we're hearing it. Yeah, so it it's it's not falling on deaf ears. Matt, let me talk about the rationale of uh, tarball artifacts rather than Git pointers, um, uh, and I'll I'll leave out whether I agree with the rationale or not, but I at least want to present it in fairness. The rationale is that, number one, not everybody is using publicly accessible Git and want to make their content available uh, without having to commit to using Git. We've got partners who use other things rather than Git. Uh, we've got partners who want to distribute uh, software that the source may not be available for, frankly, right? We don't, we're not going to push that ourselves, but if partners want to do that, we want to enable that. We also have uh, uh, customers who want to be able to uh, package that stuff up and and they may not, there may not be a clear provenance of the source in their own uh, private repos. Uh, and so what they want is a stable artifact that they can always point to and say, at the time that we delivered it, this is the artifact, right? And that also allows for things like signing and stuff that's important in an enterprise uh, uh, environment uh, and is a key part of the, uh, the, the on-premise offering of Galaxy that's called Automation Hub that customers have been asking for for a very long time. They've wanted something like Galaxy but only for their own content that they can so they can use the same tools to manage that content without having to share that content with the whole world so that's the high level purpose behind what automation hub is and why it's using those artifacts again i'm not opining on whether i would have made those decisions the right way but I, at least i wanted to to represent the rationale Yeah, just uh, one comment. The Python ecosystem uses the same approach. So when you create a package and upload it to the pypy.org, the package is there, stable, packaged, and as I said, you can do, uh, you can sign the release or whatever you need. But the tool that knows how to install packages, that's the pip, pip for example, or pip env or whatever, knows how to install for, from Git repositories, but that has nothing to do with the PyPy org that is hosting the packages, that is the part of the tool. So even if the Ansible Galaxy, if, if you want to add the ability to install things for, uh, from Git repository, we can probably add this to the command Galaxy itself, not to the Ansible Galaxy server. So. I don't see much of a problem here with using tarballs. Right, and I, I think that that's that's probably a key feature that if it, if it isn't already there, we should make sure it's there pretty quickly, is the ability to install from Galaxy by a source if the uh, uploader provides a source to download from. I, I think that's a key feature that should be there if it isn't. That was my question. In fact, I, maybe I didn't ask properly, but my question was, when will we have in the Galaxy CLI, CLI the, the ability to, to install from, from sources? Yeah, and that's the part that I was saying, like, we don't, we don't, don't have, have a timeline to share, but it's, it's uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not, we're, 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 we hear it, uh, and we, there's a lot of 
there, there's still w w with some of the kind of internal reorganization of the the resources and things it's like the the ownership of the galaxy cli client and and like who you know who has time to work on it on right. the as far as the red hat employees is still kind of an open question that's but it, still, it gives us it gives us more ammunition to push that feature right so thank you yes. for asking for it uh we'll, we'll we'll go keep fighting for it Thank you. Um, I have a, a little question because I'm a bit confused currently. I mean, you can currently already use uh, Ansible Galaxy with a requirements file and specify your own GitHub repositories in there to install content. Is that something different or, or where's my mistake here currently? Yeah, the, and... the problem is that around the, around the shape of the, the collection, the repository, um, it, it, it's a little bit simpler. It's a little bit simpler for roles. You know that that was there for roles, and it was really just um, the the primary concern or the initial concern was uh, making sure that that the Galaxy, the actual like Galaxy server use case was covered end to end. And so that's that's what's there right now. But this is you know because Galaxy doesn't support this yet. That there's there's a, clearly a gap here that that needs to be filled or that you know hopefully will be filled. It's just a matter of you know finding someone to to fill in all the pieces. Plus, like I said, there's there there are some technical issues around the shape of the repository um, because there was there were, some people had expressed a desire to be able to host multiple collections in the same repository, which uh, makes for uh, let's just say it makes that a lot more interesting. Uh, from an implementation perspective, than the typical one role equals one repo in uh, in the in the old legacy, you know, in the roles case. Okay, cool. Yeah, these are not unsolvable problems. It's just something that has to get some priority on the on the you know inside development and or community if there are people that that you know want to contribute to that. Yeah, and you know, one one thing that we want to avoid doing is like not releasing any of this stuff till it's done. We want to get stuff out there. So collections went in as a prototype in 2.a, and they're you know much more functional and usable as of Ansible 2.9. So you can take Ansible 2.9 today and start using these collections, and lots of people have, and they've been giving us feedback. And then in 2.10, we've done the mass migration or the uh, great git delete of code and moved everything to new places. So we have been sort of trickling is probably a, the wrong term because some of these changes are a bit bigger than that. But um, yeah, two to eight works with collections, yeah. And you know, as we've been finding bugs, we've been backporting those bug fixes to 2.9. So you know, more people can use this, give us feedback, test how it works. Because until people use this stuff in Angular, we don't necessarily know what some of the issues are going to be. A lot of the stuff we are aware of, uh, you know, when we're tracking it and we've got project boards to do that, but uh, this feedback is all really useful. Um, any other questions on these bits so far? Uh, I've not been paying attention on the ILC for a bit. Um, is there anything there? Oh, and just wanted to say um, anyone in ILC, they can do a hash action. Hash action, sorry. Um, and that should go in the logs, um, especially around documentation or specific stuff that's confusing. I have one Thank one you. further uh, comment, maybe from a customer point of view. Um, I wrote it already in an IRC, but um, what I see often is that people are reluctant to install anything other than an RPM. So uh, I think what would be really helpful is at least when the documentation would say something also for production environment, it's suggested to install a collection in that way. So uh, it's clear to people that it's not a hacky way to use the Ansible Galaxy to install something for production use case. Yes, uh, we will have 
RPMs. Let me uh, stick a note in IRC of the most bits to add to the documentation. Yeah, it's it's interesting. We've got a lot of different customer perspectives on that, and that's part of the challenge, right? Is that there are a large part of customers and users who don't trust anything that isn't an RPM. There are also a growing number of customers and users who don't trust anything that isn't containerized the way they want it. So that's that's a that's a constant pressure across the Red Hat ecosystem, not just for us, and making sure that we ultimately provide solutions across the board for those users and customers is something that we we know about and we care about. It's just tricky to solve everyone's problem at once. And it's just going to take Absolutely. some time. To get but it's, it's great to hear you have it on your focus. <laughs> yep. Cool. So now we'll um, shift gears a bit more into the, uh, the the engineering side. So we've just been so far we've been talking about the user impact from this stuff. Um, thanks, Tana. Uh, and now we'll move into the sort of how 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 we got to where we are today. So uh, Svati, if you're still around, um, if you'd be able to talk a little bit about the the need for the scenarios and migration script, um, maybe in sort of uh, for sort of five ten minutes, something like that. That'd be great. Hey, so um, what I want to talk about is. Uh, the challenges that we faced uh, when uh, removing uh, all your favorite modules from the core repository and putting them into different places. So, um, if you look at the pull request that uh, removed all of this stuff uh, from the repository, from the core repository Ansible Ansible, you will notice that there are more than 2 million lines removed. That's a lot. And, uh, well, it's hard to do manually. So um, about half a year ago, we were asked to try automating this. And uh, since that, we've had a lot of different requirements and different uh, ideas from uh, business folks uh, and community folks and uh, all of these people on how the end result should look like, like whether we should move everything into one huge collection or whether we should separate that into a ton of uh, different repositories on GitHub. Uh, so we ended up working on a script that uh, was taking a different scenarios uh, as inputs, and scenarios would uh, describe mm -hmm. how uh, how the end result uh, may look. And uh, uh, folks uh, who produce these ideas, they uh, wrote scenarios and ran this script, mm -hmm. and uh, well, they got some results. Over the time, most of the scenarios uh, were declared as unusable, and the first versions uh, were meant to remove as much as possible from core, and everything was breaking, of course. Um, the script, uh, in the end, it, uh, I think, ended up running for about an hour. But when we made some small mistakes uh, in indentations of cycles, of loops, uh, sometimes it ran uh, like for 10 hours just to remove these 2 million lines into and put them into different repos. And why is that? It's uh, because not 
it's because uh, it's not just uh, removing files and putting them into a different location. We had to parse Python code and YAML files and all of these uh, different types of files and uh, intelligently replace things in them, like uh, imports of things from core when one module uh, moves to one collection and then other module moves to other collection and this first module wants to reference the second module. We have to know uh, how to replace all of the imports there. And then we also had to identify which tests are related to those modules and do all of these replacements in those tests as well, which is quite hard to do. Um, Besides that, there were places like uh, mentions of uh, module names and collections names and full qualified collections names in the documentation and in all of these related places. And from the very beginning, we knew that we couldn't automate everything and it, that we would have bugs. And this uh, final uh, migration run uh, was not an exception. We made uh, like more than we were expecting to achieve. So that's cool, but uh, the collections we've got, they have some bugs. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, we've done some mistakes in uh, replacing those imports uh, in related modules and so on. So if you are testing those uh, collections, you may hit some problems and some things may still uh, need to be uh, fixed. So keep this in mind. Uh, what else? Um, as for integra integration and unit tests, we, we tried to identify everything automatically, but uh, some things had to be marked uh, as related manually and we had to special case things, uh, which also led to some problems. So there are maybe may some uh, issues with that as well. Uh, during the whole period of writing this uh, migration uh, script, uh, we tried to do some sanity testing, so we connected uh, GitHub Actions CI to just run this script every few hours for an hour and see if it uh, fails horribly or less so. Um, as different people wanted to test the results of uh, our script of what it produces, uh, we've uh, integrated a GitHub app, which was uh, actually pushing all of these results, the special test uh, organization on GitHub. So each run updated hundreds of repositories on GitHub and people could uh, test the, those things, those resultant collections, as well as this migrated core with remote stuff. It was a pretty cool experience. And yeah, it took some effort to, do, to implement. Um, we had to uh, write things like um, ignore txt file in tests, uh, which is the file that lists uh, some uh, sanity linting issues to be ignored because uh, uh, when we move some things into collections, uh, we th these files should only refer those things. Um, also, we have this uh, tool called Ansible Test, which is used to be only for the core repository Ansible slash Ansible, but then it was migrated to also support collections. And uh, this is the primary tool that you should use when testing those collections. And most of core features that it supports uh, are also supported in the collections environments. So basically, uh, when you install the recent Ansible versions, 
uh, the Ansible test command is exposed to you. And then you can uh, invoke it as Ansible test uh, units or Ansible test integration or Ansible test sanity, and it will uh, run so, uh, those types of tests. Uh, the same way it runs them for core. So it's kind of pretty cool. Um, for last reason that I wanted to tell you, uh, do you have any questions? I don't see any in uh, blue jeans. And do you have any questions in IRC? Probably not. Mm, that's all for me, I guess. Cool. Thank you very much, and especially since I put you on the on the spot only 15 minutes ago to prep some bits on that. But it's it's really important that people understand why it's taken a while to get this stuff um, working, and uh, um, and especially given the uh, the changes in direction that happened on a hourly basis. Cool. So I think now is a good point to take a break for. Uh, 15 minutes, uh, go grab yourself a copy, stretch your legs. Um, Carol, would you be able to throw up the 15 minute timer again? Yep, I'll do that. Thank you, everyone. See you in 15. Thanks, everyone. See you in 15 minutes.